This meeting is being recorded. Welcome one and all to the Regeneration podcast. Michael Martin, I'm going to begin with a bang. I'm going to give you a quote and you tell me the author, okay? Okay. Actually, we're going to do two. First one short. Quote, the hive has become larger than the house. The bees are destroying their captors. What the locust hath left, the caterpillar hath eaten. And the little garden and house of our friend Jones is in a bad way. Maybe the clue, our friend Jones, that type of, that would be emblematic of this type of writer or this writer. Yeah. The hive has become larger than the house. The bees are destroying their captors. What the locust hath left, the caterpillar hath eaten. And the little house and garden of our friend Jones is in a bad way. I don't know, but it's his, his picture you've well. seen behind me somewhere. It is uh, it's G.K. Chesterton in that case. Is it okay? Yeah, you know the hive was kind of uh, it showed up at the end of uh, I think one of his greatest books, What's Wrong with the World. And um, I'm going to give you one more here. You're going to guess. Um, this one is a little bit longer, but not too long. We have reached, in fact, a moment in the history of humanity when an attempt is being made to take evolution out of the hands of our slowly evolved human conscience and give it an expert twist in another direction, a direction selected to suit a regimented society, monstrously, informally, logical, and with a terrifying weight of science to back it up. In fact, this whole war is a tragic attempt on the part of slave states to dam up nature's 20,000-year-old struggle to free the individual from the tribe, the state, the race, the nation. Um, This goes back, but Germany is attempting to destroy what evolution has done to make the individual the purpose of life, and is trying with scientific ruthlessness to sidetrack us into the ghastly uniformity of automatic slavery, of the automatic slavery of ants and bees. Almost sounds like Bergio. Okay, in this case, it's, I've teased this guy so many times, that's a line from John Cowper Powis. Okay. And uh, I'll I'll tease this a little bit more, that Powis in writing a book called Mortal Strife, he had a, he was writing what he saw developing in Germany. And I want to make the case um, over some time here that maybe like, you know, the state of Israel, uh, that becoming what they hate, you know, have they become something of an apartheid society for being, you know, for looking at that, the evil in Hitler's Germany. And similarly in America and in the West, using Hitler's Germany, an unmitigated evil, have we become to a certain extent, you know, what we've hated? And I asked, I asked that question because, Michael Martin, for the next couple of weeks, today being an introduction, um, we're going to be looking at um, this thing that some people would call, our friend Guido Preparato will join us in a week or so. He calls it the techno structure. A guest uh, next week, he'll be actually on next week, uh, well-known Paul Kingsnorth calls it the machine. Um, I've usually referred to it in my writings and my thinking as the coming termite state, the, uh, the beehive. Uh, St. Oakspray, the author of The Little Prince, said on his deathbed, I even have this one. He said, uh, the future termite mound frightens me. Um, it's built by huge ants. If I return someday from this necessary but thankless task, he was flying May off an airplane. Only one question will be asked of me. What should one say to human beings to make them become human beings? Uh, who else? We knew that um, Powies thought people were looking more like ants. Um, Northrop Fry saw a coming insect state. Lewis Mumford, he conjectured a coming mega machine, that was his language, where humans are interchangeable appendages in a centrally controlled system. And so it goes on and on. And uh, dear friends who are listening to the podcast a couple of weeks ago, we teased a series will be unfolding over the next year or so on the Russian Silver Age theologians. Uh, Today, we're kind of teasing a theme that we're going to be unpacking for the next two weeks and uh, beyond that too. And it's, uh, how would you describe it, my friend, Michael? Well, I am it's uh well it's uh, people have been warning about them and this is put it this way um the things all those guys were warning about <laughs> they they were anticipating uh something that was already uh kind of um the desire of the powerful put it that way mm-hmm. but now the powerful has the te- have the technology to do that that's a key issue right there. Yeah, and I and I think um, I remember. So uh, I just actually I just finished uh, an essay for 
a short essay for the American mind, if you know that. I do, I do. And they asked me to write on transhumanism. Spencer Clavin, good guy, asked mm -hmm. me to do that. And so, you know, I've been thinking about transhumanism for a long time since uh, I started teaching college, actually. actually. And the first class I taught had a chapter in the reader. There was a reader I was using, and, and the chapter in the reader uh, was, a, was actually a chapter from Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was later made into the movie Blade Runner. Right. And in, in, in Dick's book, you know, the, the, the linchpin is that, and, and in the movie Blade Runner, so most people have seen that. Um, the, the thing is, it's increasing, it's, it's impossible almost without uh, a sophisticated test in that world to tell whether or not a being is a human or an android. Right. Right. And I think we're getting that. And what I, what I was writing for the American Mind is, uh, you know, we're at this weird moment. And I remember we talked to Sarah, uh, Sarah Height. You know, was one was back in the fall. That was fun, yeah. And well, it was fun. And, and what she was seeing with AI becoming more human-like, right? And we know this mm -hmm. has been going on. And now we have uh, with, with like Chat GPT and all this other stuff that's that's it's making it so easy. To, to be a simulacra of the human, right? Or at least to, to, to front as a human. Even there's robo doctors and what uh, robo lawyers now, right? Mm -hmm. And robo teachers are next, trust me. I right? know it. And that's what's happening, right? Um, so, but it's weird that the more um, the machines come, become human-like, the more humans become machine-like. That's what I was going to say. I mean, two things you were, you know, when you first started speaking, um, and again, I'm sure Paul Kings North and Greta will have a lot to say about this, but termite mound, um, ant heap, machine, technostructure, and see it as faceless, like it just happened, right? And you raised the question of, you know, did, and the quote from Powie said, you've always had kind of like people in authority who just want to press down on people, but now they have like incredible amount of like science backing them up and it makes it terrifying. And the other one is, despite that, it seems to me that it's a tool in people's hands right now. And we'll talk over the next couple of weeks about who they might be. And we're gonna try and be as specific as possible listeners. Mm -hmm. um, that the other one is, you know, whenever we think about technology and you made that excellent point, is that if we think about, uh, people know I use brain hemispheric stuff, but you know, it's, um, it's making the left brain just so hypertrophied and it makes the, the right brain atrophy. And right. so there's a push pull factor here, you know, that we do uh, everything that's presented to us. Now, all the old human emotions are even presented to us as like a chemical thing going on in your body. You know, you didn't actually feel that, you know, what in the DSM this year, there's that major news story that all of a sudden it occurred to people that depression was not just a chemical imbalance. Right. Um, right. And so these are, these are big things. <clears throat> Continue. Yeah. Well, I remember this. So 20 years ago, there was a YouTube video or something I would show my students on transhumanism because I started to make transhumanism a theme in this uh, this writing course I taught. And uh, the students all thought it was nuts. <laughs> they thought there's some fun of mine. This is never going to happen. And now, you know, bodies, bodies like the World Economic Forum and, and so forth are, are actually advocating for it, mm -hmm. for a, a kind of transhumanism. And I think in, in, that, in fact, in the article I, I wrote for American Mind, um, and there was a great, I get, maybe we should link it uh, on this. There's a great video that came out this week from Unheard. Do you know? Okay, I do very well. The British news source. <clears throat> and it was a lecture uh, by this professor, I assume, named Mary Harrington. Brilliant. Oh, yeah, I know her well. Yeah, she is. And she's talking there's a, about- There's a conversation online too with our guest next week, Paul Kingsnorth and Mary Harrington. Oh, really? On, yeah, from Unheard, there are videos. Okay, well, what Mary Harrington was saying, and I think it's brilliant, is that transhumanism isn't on its way. It's been here. Yes. The first uh, implementation of the transhumanist project was uh, hormonal birth control, or known as the pill to you and me, right? Mm -hmm. because it changes women's bodies it modifies them and not because they're sick mm -hmm. or or you could say I mean, you could say it treats uh 
<laughs> naturally occurring, occurring rhythms in a female's menstrual cycle as a disease, right? Yeah. But it, but that's what, and that's where her her argument is that we've already had this. This has been going on since then, and we know this. And in fact, it was I showed it to some students this week, one class, <laughs> where it's a it's a class where we examine arguments and rhetoric and, and performance and stuff. And uh, this class happened to have a lot of women in it. And I asked them, you know, do you think this is true? And they said, yeah. And they they looked concerned, might be the word, but they, they kind of had a wake up moment for a second. And I talked to them, and, and I think you've heard this too, that uh, there's, there's scientific proof that when women stop taking artificial birth control, all of a sudden they look at their spouse or their boyfriend and they're like, oh, how I'm not attracted to you. Uh -huh. I didn't know <laughs> that. Them, you know, from at a at a chemical biological level, yeah, and it, yeah. their their natural desires and attractions are subverted. Yeah, right. I I had not heard. It totally makes sense, though. And yeah. anyway, when I was trying to say so, twenty years ago, I had there's this video, and one of the it was kind of warning. I think it was put up by some Christians. Uh, it was warning about the the advent of transhumanism and with it turning in you know the whole idea one of the ideas of transhumanism is to turn us into a hive mind right and how many times have right. you seen this on right. the internet mm -hmm. hive mind what's the best pizza sauce or whatever right but it's really uh it's a project that that I mean, yeah it's as it's a, if it's really a good about thing data, it's yeah. about aggregating human beings into this um uh, you know in into something to be optimized and to be to be instrumentalized mm -hmm. into, and not to be human beings which is right, not even right. secondary anymore it's, it's a tertiary concern mm -hmm. yeah the um one of the things about it too you know it's the uh uh, some people, you know, when we, share with me your opinion, we could look at somebody like, you know, when our friend Guido Preparata is on, he talks about like these intermarried kind of the American Commonwealth and so forth. We also mentioned the World Economic Forum. It seems to me when we look at it kind of the way you were just talking about, we don't have to necessarily pick people as people like Dr. Evil, though they are in a different way. But, you know, in a world, I guess Dostoevsky said, in a world without, you know, God, anything is possible. Um, or there's no such thing as truth. And I don't claim to have the exact quote, you know, but the, um, the notion that we've created a world that some people honestly think this is the right way to go. You know, there's this huge notion for preparata that when you start building a beehive or a termite mound or a machine the that, you know, prepotence, the sheer joy out of putting your boot on another person, you know, being above them, it does right. take out a, on a heightened glamour that a more diffuse thing. So then, you know, one of the upshots there too is that, you know, Jordan Peterson just doesn't think we, for example, doesn't think we could ever get out of hierarchies or even the dominance of hierarchies. They're literally everywhere for him. And um, I think, you know, if you follow history and Preparata could put a huge context on that to say, we've only really been thinking that intensely about hierarchies since the building of the mega machine, since the building of the techno structure, because that is the dominant force, but there's a way to build another society where you don't have to do that. And you and I both know, uh, we both homeschooled our kids. You're currently homeschooling your kids. Um, we both know a Catholic homeschoolers, Michael, who um, when it comes to the machine, they create a haven and a heartless world in their home. But the whole idea is to give them a better, they're in a secret competition with the public schools a secret competition with the machine so that when we turn our kids outside of our house, we're saying like, go kick the shit out of them in the machine. Right. Uh -huh. And, you know, and that you and I with social three folding, um, we're always trying to build another world where you don't have to have one anthropology in your house church, in your homeschool, and then put on another anthropology when you go out into the world. Right. Well, I mean, so it's interesting. It's, there's a, the principle in biodynamic farming, and I, you know, Guido uses biodynamic farming as a, an economic model. Right. In one of his essays, which is, I think, that's how he encountered his work. But in uh, biodynamic farming, um, the idea is you know, there's a, 
so he's kind of like my <laughs> in my lineage like if i was a Bo tibetan buddhist my lineage it, it goes back to uh alan chadwick through alan york and alan york who died well, seven years ago something six years ago he and he was relatively young but his there's a, the, a film and our, our listeners should check it out if they can find it i think it's pretty readily available called the biggest little farm and alan's in that, that film that's very so, popular yeah it's about a this couple who buy some land and want to start biodynamic farm <laughs> they don't know anything about farming <laughs> and mm. they hire alan as a consultant one of the things he tells them in this interview he goes, well, you know, they're, they want to grow nectarines there in California. He goes, well, how, you know, he's like, well, how many varieties do you think should grow? And they say, I don't know, two or three. How about 26? That's great. Diversity, diversity, diversity. That's the whole thing, right? Uh -huh. And I think if we look at the way uh, community structures work, I would also say diversity, diversity, diversity. Right, right, right. Because the thing is, if we don't forget, I mean, probably the, the archetype of the techno structure, I'm sorry to say, is the Catholic Church, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about hierarchy. But the thing is, until relatively recently, that hierarchy had, you know, very little power at the micro level. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, at the, you know, so you have cardinals and the Pope arguing about stuff in, in Rome. But some little village in Ireland or Poland or wherever, they have no idea what's going on, you know. And they're right, just, right, right. they're they're Catholic, but they're 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 Catholic in uh, their very uh, singular way, mm -hmm. you know, culturally, et cetera. Uh, and then, but what happens with when we get uh, mass communication technology, right? Where you know you can have a and now you, it's instant with the internet, but even with the advent of newspapers and then later with uh, with radio, then television, you know, that message gets out at a much more uh, expedient pace. And, it ex which, and uh, with the advances in psychology from Edward Bernays, Freud's nephew, yeah. it's, it's a very sophisticated messaging. You know, we think of Guido who talks about the propaganda pheromones of a certain type of right. ants. You know, it's crazy, right? Well, that's true. And I, and I, but the thing is, if you, if you have diversity, 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 you know, and you, uh, you know, it be kind of like a hedge school, right? And yeah. that's what homeschooling in a way is hedge school, is a hedge school. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's countercultural. And because you, you know, you don't want to be part of the machine. You don't want your kids to be part of the machine. And you know what, you know, we should have him on the show sometime, but uh, he'd been a guest over at the monastery several times when I was the retreat house guy there. I, I, I invited him to school here to give a talk. So I consider him a friend is the theologian William Kavanaugh. Right. And, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's great on defining, you know, when you're talking about Europe and the, the Irish Catholics, you know, what he calls is uh, modernity also invented, you know, homogenous space. There used to be complex space in the Middle Ages. You had this obligation to the Margrave, this obligation to the church this obligation to the Duke and um, there are overlapping loyalties now with the nation state, the definition of which is, you know, the nation state is that entity that has the power to kill in a certain geographical space. You know, that's what right. it calls homogeneous space that lends itself to the building of a techno structure beehive machine. You know, and at this point, a little, not a commercial, but just reminding people during this next week, do yourself a favor, go to Paul King's North Substack. It's called, um, what is it called again? The like, Abbey of Misrule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and you know, at least Google any tire, uh, title you see that has the word machine in there, because he's he's been mining this for a long time. And so is our friend Guido. And you know, in his website, I just went to it before we came on. I do believe you could download his essay called "The Techno Structure." He just sent me a new introduction to that essay uh, yesterday. It's brilliant. Right. But that'll be part of like what he would share with us. <clears throat> but you know, I think this is worth you know, studying the history, because we're not just trying to, uh, we, we got to get very precise about how this thing works, who serves it, you know, because some people, they see it, and my own friends, you know, at Front Porch Republic, it's a normal approach, but many people with that worldview could say the only answer is, like, to to do away with technology and machines, right. you know, and I think you and I, Guido, probably, Paul, we don't necessarily think that, but it's the idea of, can you get the genie back in the bottle? And right. the answer is yes, we can. Ivan Illich had a notion of convivial tools. Um, so yeah. we're going to get very specific about this whole thing. Go ahead. Well, the good news is there's a there's a substantial 
countercultural movement on this exact topic. Mm -hmm. And it used to used to feel I used to feel so lonely. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd be like a voice crying in the wilderness. But but the the figures you just mentioned, but also, you know, John Michael Greer. Absolutely. He's part of that diversity of, of opinion and uh questioning of the machine, right? And Absolutely. what he calls it. And I, in fact, I was mentioning it in, in an article I, I wrote, you know, in his book uh, that we talked about a couple weeks ago, uh, The Retro Future, you know, he talks about the the Butlerian carnival. That's right. To Butlerian Jihad, which is in uh -huh. the Dune series. The Butlerian Jihad is when the society says, nope, no more thinking machines no more sentient AI because it's destroying what it means to be human, which is why when you get to Dune, which it comes much later, you know, there, there are no computers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how can there be no computers in the future? Well, because this, <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> because right. precisely what's happening right now. But those, that, those guys, um, John Moriarty, the Irish philosopher died 10 years ago, something he was, he was certainly doing this. Martin Shaw, who, who whom I'll be mention, um, interviewing for Jesus the Imagination. In fact, right the next volume of Jesus the Imagination is on the household of things, which is exactly this kind of thing we're talking about. It was, you know, it's not the, the machine, it's the anti-machine, right? Right. The yeah. household, it's the it's the real economy. Mm -hmm. Right? The household of things. And that's yep. what that's what Guido talks about as well, right? No, you're 100 percent. I mean, it's it's uh, just 100 percent true. There's something that occurred to me maybe in the last week. It's probably, you know, some things become explicit to us, though they've been implicit for a long time. But, um, you know, if we if we start looking at the machine, I think it helps free up these just these useless categories of left and right now. Right. You know, but also what I noticed, too, let's, um, you know, theologically in, in the church. Uh, I see this in, in Guido's writings. I know it's true in Powis. It's probably the thing I love about him most. Uh, neither of these guys are necessarily conventional pew-sitting Catholics. Certainly not Powis. Um, but when we, when we really understand the machine, I think what it does for the gospel is that we realize that like the traditional understanding we have of the church, that we might look at this thing and try and throw holy water at it and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Hey, folks, it's not going to work. Um, all these, it's demonic for sure. It's not going to work. But what you find in the writings of these people is that kind of an, two things. One is an anarchistic original Christianity is the real antidote, right? A humility from the bottom up, um, hummus, um, humility, humor. All of these things are super important. And so the anarchist Christ, the kind of the simple people of the land things, really gets foregrounded when we name what's going on in the world accurately. That's why I think what Paul and Guido are doing. And the, the other one implied in... Um, in the word, you know, humility and humor is the role of comedy. And I want to say this too, that um, in the writings, this is maybe the most explicitly I've talked about just one, one of the millions of insight of Powis, a world towering genius, is that he knew, um, for example, that through Rabelais, Shakespeare, Cervantes, the great, you know, we need to incorporate them. But he could even look at Charlie Chaplin and say, there's two things I want to say is one is, when you look at the great humorous, this would be true in Powis' mind of Cervantes, Shakespeare, um, and Rabelais, is that the non-recognition of the equality of all souls is the basis of all humor. So look at Charlie Chaplin, you know, sending Hitler up the river with humor. The non-recognition of the equality of all souls is the basis of all humor. When somebody walks around thinking we're all not the same, or like one of my friends at work at the monastery, I'm not Catholic, you know, just referred to somebody and said, I think that guy thinks he's better than me. You know, that's a classic statement. And so, um, and also Powys would say that the equality of all souls, all this other stuff we claim about the centrality of Christ. Um, I believe Christ was the center of history and the evolution of consciousness and so forth. But Powys will say, you damn sure don't see the equality of all souls here. You don't see it here in these other religions. You know, and that this is the major thing that, you know, everybody's our neighbor. And when we finally name, I believe, name the techno structure, <clears throat> name the antipe, and when we describe what's actually going on, we will see again, it'll clarify because we need a new iteration of the Catholic church. It'll help us jettison this kind of magic thing 
and it'll bring us back to that gospel insight, which is the great liberating message of the children and sons of daughters of God, you know, this type of thing. Yeah. Does that make any sense to you, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of my favorite authors, I think he's in the pantheon for me, is in the top three. Who is H.J. H. J. Massingham. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and his book, Tree of Life, Alps, through his books. That's what his one of his points is that Christendom lost its way when it became the machine. Mm -hmm. Right. And it became, you know, uh, this is really, too, powerful, right? and really where, where most exists is, I mean, look, Jesus was a carpenter. They're, he's dealing with fishermen. So this is, uh -huh. this is, this is more than grassroots, right? This is, yeah. this is, uh, this is the way and you know, the way it's the, and he's, he was an agrarianist, you know, so he was the village was the way and the land was the way. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I, I think what it also happens is um, it, that, <clears throat> I mean, it's focusing on the real, right? The right. Those things are focusing on the real, which take us out of the technosphere, right? Yep. Um, and Shakespeare does the same thing. I mean, Shakespeare, Shakespeare I was, I'm teaching this online course and, and actually uh, an at my house course for homeschool kids on Shakespeare right now. And uh <laughs> And in fact, this week we're doing uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, and it's awesome. It's stunning to see how and how he uses humor, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Not just to um, take the powerful down a peg, but also to to take you know just to point at the human condition. And he mm -hmm. does it in such a way that he doesn't rob them of dignity, even in the, the Midsummer Night's Dream with the mechanicals, right? The, the rude mechanicals who put on the play, Bottom and his friends. Um, he, he, people, critics, I mean, critics are, are, are horrible, will we'll interpret that as um, Shakespeare making horrible, fun of people. But no, he's not. Those are the people Shakespeare grew up with. Yeah, yeah. He, he's from the countryside, which was, you know, he knows those guys mm -hmm. and he loves them. But you, and I always tell people, you can't make fun of people unless you, you understand them. Right. You know, and he understands them and he understands the powerful as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And nobody gets off the hook in that, in that play. No, no, no. What, right? what, what, what's, what is it that Puck says? Well, oh, what, what fools these mortals be, right? Yeah. And, which and when is, you and I talk about regeneration, we're talking about... <laughs> You know, that the church has to, you know, reincorporate some paganism again. But you and I both know that, and I've mentioned the names before, you know, until the church can also include almost in its canon, Shakespeare, Cervantes, Rabelais, yeah. you know, <clears throat> Montaigne. What really struck me this week, in the last couple of weeks, is I haven't read Shakespeare in a few years because I haven't taught Shakespeare. And I was supposed to teach it a few times, but the class would cancel or they'd change the schedule. I'm like, I'm starting. And this is a college that I'm the only guy who teaches Shakespeare there. And right. they haven't offered Shakespeare for English majors. Yeah, it's like offered every fifth year or something. It's such, it's unheard of. But anyway. Yeah. That's by design from the high, folks. So anyway, what, sh what really stunned me by reading Shakespeare this week is... Of course, the beauty of his writing, for one thing, and the insight, but also comparing this the consumption of Shakespeare's language to what I have been really kind of inundated with over the last three years, mostly through social media and stuff like that. It's it's like I came out of the desert, mm -hmm. you know. Talk yeah, about it tasted so about, good, right? Talk about grounding or reconnecting with the real, mm -hmm. and poetry does that. And it's what really what really jumped out at me reading. Mr. Mind's dream this week is the poetry through the whole thing. Yeah. It's just, you know, and he, and it was an earlier play for Shakespeare. So he was, it was, uh, it's really uh, rich in poetic idioms and different kinds of poetry, which is really cool because he has the, the fairies speak one kind of poetry and the humans speak another kind. The humans mostly speak blank verse. And the, the but the fairies speak in couplets or in other mm -hmm. in other kinds of, of songs, which is just beautiful. The uh, that was an early one this week, movie and read. I I, I paid attention to the Tempest again. So I, I believe most people think that's his last one. But I am, um, you know, the uh, the the hive too, and it kind of jives with a lot of what you're saying. It allows any young person I speak to now, and you and I talk this way, Michael, you know, something feels like it's going to happen. Something feels like it's going to happen. And I think uh, the hive 
and this analysis, which we're going to take a deep dive on over the next couple of weeks, it allows us to kind of embrace that apocalyptic mood as an unveiling. And again, I think we can, um, you know, that when I believe, you know, one thing, again, if we look at it clearly enough, we see that the antidote to it is a form of Christianity, but it's not the one we're used to. Um, and, uh, you know, here's another, I'm going to give another Powis one. Well, it's, you know, the machine Christianity, right? Yeah, right. And, you know, gonna... in, Huxley's, in Huxley's Brave New World, right, mm -hmm. he doesn't have the Archbishop of Canterbury. He has the, the arch community songster. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Which yeah. is what it is, right? It is, it is, it is. I mean, so really, you... the church, the Anglican church, I, mean, I love the Anglican tradition, but my goodness, the Anglican church is really a, a weapon of the machine. Well, right. Addison Hodges Hart was sending him up the river last week. Pretty good yeah. on the same type of stuff, right? So listen to this one. Uh, you know, and, and the way when we look at the machine, the way I think, again, when we were talking about the brain and how it atrophies, you know, uh, the right brain and this kind of push-pull factor and all this stuff, once we can get into that way of seeing things, how we're affected and being affected by, um, we're going to see that when I believe that when we get a correct analysis of what's going on by using some of the insights of uh, King's North Preparata, the people who've gone before, Lewis Mumford, that it will help us change where the church and Christianity needs to be. And that could be apocalyptic too, because it's going to look in my mind a hell of a lot different. So this is another quote by Powis. And he's saying in like 1943, he goes, for it would appear that what some call the spirit world, but which I prefer to call the next dimension, has its thinnest and least obstructive wall uh, where we are in closest touch, not with love or religion or philosophy, but with the elements. This reminds me of you in the real, Michael. He said, you know, now this has nothing to do with the difference between city life and country life. Uh, for a man can be quite as alone, more often very alone in a great city than in a country village. It has to use uh, to do with communion, to use Berjayev's pet word. He read Berjayev so closely yeah. uh, with the so-called inanimate. You know, and, and Powis thought that if we can connect daily by I'm here looking at kind of cloudy skies in Western New York, kind of sinking ourselves into the elements again, yeah. fire, earth, air and water, um, the, the, the site for both Ivan Illich and Powys of like a weed breaking through concrete growing up and sink into that. Will that's a form of spirituality that these guys are saying will create the humble person that can be the real comedic counterfoil, anarchistic, humble counterfoil to the machine, you know, and I'm kind of beating this drum, but I think we should be very excited about this analysis and its fruits, you know. Right, and it's, I mean, those, I mean, um, a person who was written for Jesus' Imagination, Jeremy Nadler. Yeah, he's great. Really great. He's a really brilliant philosopher, but he won't he won't participate in the academic project. He, he's a gar he works as a gardener in Oxford, um, and and he. Uh, he points out to I mean he talks about the, the the how the machine in his infiltrated gardening right yep. and he points to like the gardens of versailles and other places like that where you know these wealthy people come in and and re-engineer the landscape right mm -hmm. using big machinery and all this other stuff changing the course of rivers um but that's not participating in nature so it's not really, yeah. really gardening. that's yeah. concrete Right. So and he, he's a gardener. I'm a gardener. Um, so how do you do it in a way that participates with nature? And I think in he, another thing he points to is the way you resist the the technicization of the human being mm -hmm. is through acts like that, through po writing or reading poetry or do, doing music and whatever it happens to be, some kind of creative word working, all kinds of things working with with one's hands. Right. That uh, that resist that. That resists mm -hmm. that in, in a huge way, and uh, and I know that's true because you know I've been editing a couple of books lately, which means I spend a lot of time sitting at my, my laptop, and I can only do that for so long. And so, you know, and even though I in the mornings and in the evenings I have to go out and do farm chores and stuff like that, um, but <laughs> what I do to, to get out of my head, out of the tech, out of the machine, is I play the guitar. Okay. And I'll play the guitar for about a half an hour in the middle of the day, just get, just get rid of it to reconnect with something that's real, right? Yeah, yep. And uh, and I think Jeremy or Nadler is great on this. Um, 
what's the what's the name of his last book? Because people should read it. You know how we sometimes lunge for books right around us. Mine's at home. It's got a purple cover, but it's a history of technology from like ancient. That's Egypt not his latest now. book, but yes. Oh, it is, yeah, okay. That's an amazing book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but he right, he's yeah. Check him out, and he's really brilliant. And can we in, get him on? Do you think, or is he not doing these types of? Uh, he won't. He won't. I tried to interview him for Jesus Imagination. He would not zoom. That's funny. That's good for him. Yeah. He would have liked yeah. an interview, but I would have had to fly to Oxford. To yeah, do it. yeah. But, so, uh, something you were just saying too reminds me. Um, maybe some of his earliest, but best work. There was an article by the uh, the political philosopher, the Notre Dame guy, Patrick Deneen, and I agree with him on some stuff. Disagree on a lot of others. You know, it's kind of one of these post liberals, and I think yeah. you and I, Michael, think there's a different way other than gaining control of the top down. You know, there's a bottom up as we're discussing. Yeah. But in one of his early insights- <laughs> Those Catholics are just drunk with hierarchy, I'm sorry. <laughs> in one of his early insights and first things, and I used to use this in the humanities class I taught, again, to break down this, you know, mind deadening, soul destroying left-right polarity. You had mentioned birth control, but um, speaking of Jeremy Nadler and the real, you know, that uh, it would be the, the right that looks at the left and says, oh, you think you can throw chemicals into a woman's body and change it. Um, you know, that's evil. But the left looks at the right saying, oh, at the monastery, you could take that hill and make it a casino and you can throw all these chemicals into the ground, including Roundup to make all this stuff grow. Right. So this is another area vis-a-vis -vis the real that the left and right are missing. You know, they're actually, um, you know, the truth is crucified between two thieves, as they say. Right. And, uh, you know, as we explore the real and the machine, let's focus on what's actually going on in the world. And these binaries of left, right cannot seem to capture it. But let's just start. Let's let go of all that jargon. Left, right, as far as I'm concerned, you know, they're the temperaments we see in Soloviev's great article on uh, like the death of Plato or something. But, you know, he knows that people people on the coast, New York and L.A., but in his case, the coast of Greece, they could just go and see Oh, you know, the Persians, for example, they, they put their spoon in their right hand. Ergo, everything's relative, right? And Socrates said, that's a stupid, you know, that's a stupid right. way of thinking, Sophist. But the conservatives in the, uh, in the middle of the country, uh, they tend to be in the heartland. They would say you know, that uh, in honoring tradition, um, that you know, nothing would change. And Socrates said, oh, you know, what you're saying is kind of right, but you're going about it in an ass back way and you take you guys so seriously. He saw that the, uh, you know, the Sophists, the so-called liberals, they were, they were, they presumed their intelligence, but they right. were actually pretty dumb and they were really serious. The, uh, the people from the heartland presumed their morality. The leftists were so immoral, but their morality was kind of soul destroying in its own way. You know, this is where we are. We're playing the same old games, folks. And we, we need a new way of analyzing things. Well, the thing is, I mean, the, uh, if you'll, you notice that um, the machine that we get through technology, through actually the kinds of technology we're even using as we speak, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, being on the internet, um, the machine doesn't like nuance. So the machine wants everything to be either left or right, black or right, over there. It wants to be, wants it to be po polarized. Yeah, and right. So when figures like uh, Naomi Wolf or Jordan Peterson, or maybe Jordan Peterson been an example, but Naomi Wolf's a good example. She's good. Or uh, Glenn Greenwald, Mm -hmm. you know who are you know they they get they have such uh liberal <laughs> credentials yeah. you know but if they question anything they're they're painted as far-right extremists mm -hmm. right and they're not this is the way the machine works this yeah. is the, the, the machine doesn't want and if we if, if you remember i mean i remember you know um when before the world was this polarized and it was before the internet. Nobody cared mm -hmm. too much. We may have some political differences. Nobody cared, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't become a religion. It didn't have that fervor that's been added to it. I don't recall that anyway. Yeah. You know, I so pr prior to the advent of the internet, I had people who were liberal friends or conservative friends, and you know, so what? Yeah, nobody cared. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, you didn't, you didn't try to cancel somebody because they had a slightly different opinion about things than you did. And know? computers don't have a sense of humor either. You know, what was that program you mentioned before that everybody's reading about something chat? Yeah, GPT. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not saying it can't happen, but like early on, you can say that um, the, uh, you know, that computers could not understand, you could say nonsense poetry, right? 
the freest man I ever met. You know, we had him on our show on monasticism, Father Ed Dillon, you know, a, a college professor from the school where I teach. They, they know that he's exceedingly brilliant. And they'll say like, Mike, what is, what is, you know, Father Ed reading? And I'll say, just ask him. And they go up to Father Ed like, what are you reading? And he'll always say, you know, Agatha Christie and the complete nonsense poems of Lewis Carroll. And he'll go into Jabberwocky, right? Uh -huh. And well, these computers, can they understand Jabberwocky? I remember I wrote an article one time on, uh, it was a test in New York State. And I might've told the story before in this place, but um, it was a state English test. And one of the reading comprehension things was based on kind of something Lewis Carroll-esque. It was kind of a nonsense story about like a lemon with something else. And there was a couple of questions about it, but it obviously, there was this hugest uproar. They had to change the scoring of the test because nobody could answer the question because it wasn't completely logical. You know, so two things, can a computer have fun when we were talking about the power, the anarchistic power of comedy? What can a computer left brain do with that? And then B, again, how, um, how computers are making us all literal, you know, literal. Uh, everything we say is literal. Yeah, you know. it was, yeah really, how are you going to? Translate twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimp <laughs> the wave. Um, right. Mimsy really borrow goes and the moan wraths out grape. How are you going to translate that into Russian? Right. <laughs> yep. Come on, can you see that? That would that you know when when Sarah was using Google Translate. Yeah, drop that one in Google Translate. See what yeah. they do. Yeah, and it's it's the most humorous thing. Which philosopher said you know laughter is the most human thing? I think it was Socrates, but you know it, somebody said it, and it's they're true. Um, so, you know, this is where we're putting down our anchor um, for the next couple of weeks. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I think this is Preparata's central thing. And I think it's uh, Paul Kingsnor's central piece. And we'll go off script with them. Um, and, you know, I encourage people to look at those. Say some other things, Michael. You know, I didn't mean to cut um, you off. Well, you know, I think a really, for me, in this whole question of transhumanism, for instance, I, I went through a period where I was reading a lot of Philip K. Dick. And he's brilliant on this because his entire project, in a way, is, you know, and this is, it's the core philosophical question. How do you know who you are? Mm -hmm. How do you know that your memories are your memories? How do you know what you think is what you think? You haven't just been, now for him, it had to do with brainwashing or, you know, implanting memories or things like this, which I think they're probably getting close to, to the the technology to try to do that, right? Yeah, yep. And, and there's, you know, this is, I think, what's his name? Uh, Noah Yuval Harari, right? Calls humans hackable animals. It's so right? scary to me, yeah. It is. Um, and, and ridiculous. And but, ridiculous. And, and that's where, and, and, you know, now I don't know, he's kind of weird because he was warning about it, but now he, he was adopted by, the World Economic Forum. So now it's like a good idea, right? Uh -huh. Similar, you know who else? And I, I think this is true. Francis Fukuyama, remember the neocon? Oh, I do, I do, the end of history. But he wrote a brilliant book on transhumanism and he wrote it over 20 years ago. It's called Our Post-Human Future, uh -huh. which blew me away when I read it. But now he's he's a, he's a he, he went back to, a, to his uh, neocon ways and he's, a, he's all in with the World Economic Forum from what I can tell. Yeah. Which is sad, right? Right. right. <laughs> but you say like so, when you say me mention Philip K. Dick saying like are our thoughts our own thoughts? When yeah. I don't when we had our son, my son on the show talking about Jordan Peterson, I think he said or he told it to me just at home that he doesn't know a single female friend of his that doesn't script their emotions every like twenty minutes at the minimum. Mm -hmm by their, their certain use of music, right? We both love music, but there's a way to use it. It can be like a drug. But like, we don't know, such as our addiction to technology, as soon as we have an uncomfortable feeling, uh, some psychologists call it process skipping. You know, we've all, we've all buried some feelings, but now it's so easy. On any time of the day, it's almost like instead of smoking a cigarette, what you do is you download a little music that makes you feel a certain way. Right, and, then of course, yep, and then of course, the upshot of this is people don't know uh, even if what they're feeling is what they're feeling, and it gets really right. mixed up. And yeah. actually, that in the opening chapter of uh, "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?" That's exactly what's going on. Or they have a thing in that book. It, Philip Kiddick had a great sense of humor uh, called uh, "The Mood Organ." Okay. Where, you know, so the woman goes in there. She's it's it's like a computer or something. They 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 can have dials for. So the woman 
is going to set herself for depression. I'm just, I'm planning myself to have a three hour depression today. She tells me, oh, yep. you go, well, you do that. I'm going to, I'm just going to be happy. I'm going to program myself for happy. Right. Uh -huh. and, which is what we do with coffee and music. We can do that. But, but the other part of this, and this is one of the things Philip K. Dick talks about in, in throughout his fiction is what happens when the corporate governmental structure gets involved and what happens it turns us into products we mm -hmm. become I mean, this is what right when we have avatars that we, we project and i and i you, were, you mentioned young women every 20 minutes have, having to reprogram themselves well you know you you see this come across especially facebook all the time and the, how but what's on TikTok, for instance, I saw it's a funny thing that Elon Musk said about a month ago that he was going to buy TikTok. And he said, sorry, ladies, I'm taking the filter away. We're going to have to see what you really look like. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's weird. Right. I mean, I'm, you would think with the the feminist revolution that we both grew up with. Right. I know. First well. wave and second wave feminism. And then. Do you think the, the the point of feminism was to make it cool to be on OnlyFans or to turn yourself into a product, to, to actually turn yourself into a, the exact thing feminism was rejecting? Mm -hmm. And then we see so many uh, so-called trans women who try to front like Barbie dolls. Like that's the mm -hmm. ideal of what it, what it is to be a woman. That is, mm -hmm. it's surreal. It's also... It's so uh, surreal. Machine, Every aspect was so surreal. That's the machine. Yeah. Right. That's what a woman's supposed to look like. That's the idea. Oh my, it's crazy. Yeah. We get like, again, that all that, when you say like fronting for the biggest bimbo, you get that at the same time as you get, when we talk about the insectification again, that there's no such thing as gender in an ant heap, there's no real male nor female in a large sense. You know, there's workers drones, you're assigned a role. Right. And that's the role of uniforms now is to like a sexist. So you get this, you know, this kind of shallow, unreal stereotype of sex combined with a complete asexuality of the ant heap. Um, and they both have different roles. And it also leads to, you know, again, the questions that this analysis leads to is, so, okay, so we have a machine. Uh, is it faceless? Is it just run itself or qui bono? You know, and th that's a huge one because it ties into this notion you and I have discussed of conspiracy theory, right? There's maybe the people running the machine wants you to put out some messaging that the people who wonder if there's somebody running the machine are stupid. They're idiots. There's something beneath contempt. They're called conspiracy theorists, right. like somebody who might make a question. Yep. Let me invoke Brother Guido. Yeah. Conspiracy theory is too important to be left to conspiracy well, theorists. Amen. Amen. Right? Yeah. But I think one, I think we, we've touched on it. We're, we're edging up to it. But I think the real thing is, um, what we're seeing, the 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 front line of attack on the real, on the real is a front line attack on the feminine. Yep. Right. And not and so it's on. You know, you see, are trans women really women? Can you know? Can, can trans women compete in women's sports? Mm -hmm. It's nuts. Um, it's nuts. And but it's also on fertility, and this is what we talked about earlier with Mary Mary Harrington's uh, lecture. You know, that's an assault on the feminine. Mm -hmm. That's on the biological feminine, but it's also because it's, and it's an assault on fertility, mm -hmm. right? The most, the whole, I mean, I've been mulling over this for the last few days. Fertility is holy. And I'm telling mm -hmm. you this as a father of nine children and as a farmer, it is a holy thing. Mm -hmm. And we treat it like it's, it's a disease. Yeah, yeah. And because of that, we treat becoming pregnant like a disease. And I, you, I have Catholic friends who are, you know, pro-choice Catholic friends who talk about uh, a fetus as a parasite. Yep. Right? That's the same thing as like, again, you can be Catholic in one sphere, the home and so on Catholic in another, like the marketplace, the institute, you know, the school or the hospital or what you're saying. Yep. So and it, it's, it's demonic and it's, well, it, and we, what, uh, wait, this is not my, my, my thing, but, uh, you know, Rudolf Steiner calls it Araman, right? Mm -hmm. This this uh, spiritual being who wants to make turn turn us all into data, mm -hmm. and just instrumentalize everybody and everything, mm -hmm. right?
right? And and the other part of that standards equation is Lucifer. And Lucifer is like this, this spiritual being who promises you freedom, right? You're going to be free. And this we see this in the trans phenomenon in particular. So say this confused person, they think they're, they were born in the wrong body, which I don't know what that means. Um, and talk about Cartesian. <laughs> Born in the wrong so body. They, right? They're born in the wrong body. But here's the thing, right? So they're born in the wrong body. So Lucifer is like, yeah, you know, yeah. I'll help you get what you really want to be yourself. And that uh, also has a free. huge metaphysics when these people back it up. Okay, if you're born in the wrong body, that means you're something of a you know you believe in the immortality of the soul. Like we have no idea. Yeah. Right? But the, but then the, so, <laughs> so they so they sell their 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 souls to 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 Lucifer and say, yes, I want the freedom. Give me the freedom to be myself. Well, what happens with the freedom is slavery, right? This is this is Berjaev's thing. Slavery. Yeah. So that you you deliver yourself to what you think is freedom, but you end up being a slave because now you're you're you have a lifetime prescript uh, uh, subscription to hormone uh, medications and surgeries, right? Mm -hmm. You have just been co opted into the machine. Uh, and in fact, when you go to a great place, you see this it's really well said. Yep. Is in Pinocchio. Colodi's Pinocchio, Same right? Where Pinocchio yeah. goes to the island of the lost boys, right? I'm going to be free. We're not going to go to school anymore. And they're turned. And he's turned into an ass. Mm -hmm. Education, which means to lead out into freedom, you know, has yeah. become its opposite in the formal sense. You know, and we're all and we're all being led, led into. You know, we're being transformed into asses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, my review of uh, your book, Transfiguration. Um, when you said, and you did, you summarized so much when you said it's really a war against women. But um, my title is based on, you had quoted, I believe, on Balthazar in your book. But I, I entitled my review of Transfiguration, Avoiding a World Without Women. Yeah. Um, and Guido's book, I entitled Avoiding the Hive. Like I read your book as all avoiding, you know, avoiding this world that could be symbolized as a world without women. And I read Preparata's book, New Directions in Catholic Social and Political Thought. And I read all these essays, magisterial, totally magisterial. Sadly, his, you know, it's, a, it's an academic publisher, so the book's pretty expensive. But, the, um, uh, but a lot of the chapters are broken down in other places on his website. But the, I read all those and I thought, wow, these people were diagnosticians of the hive. He was hoping when he worked at the Vatican to create you know, a movement in the Vatican that could kind of, again, align themselves with what was really going on in the world. And he, like I do, saw the possibilities that once the Vatican aligns the gospel with what's really going on in the world, really real, then it will lead to this more humble, um, anarchistic, freedom-loving Christ that we know so well and we can meet in the sacrament, you know, and things like that. But the machine doesn't like that, Mike. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. It's pretty savvy. It's pretty savvy. It's faceless, Michael. It's faceless. Nobody's that's actually in charge. Yep. Hey, that's why I'm looking forward to the, the publication of Guido's new book, right? Church the and... Yeah, you wrote that. I read your introduction. It's excellent. Is it, is it out yet? No, I, well, it could be. You know, he's. It's all kind of coming together. He's actually this weekend at a conference okay. in Italy where I think they're getting real about launching a perishable currency in a, in a community. Awesome. Currency. Yep. Um, and it's a different part of Italy. But the uh, oh, what was one other thing? It was I think a world without women. To, to, to um, when we look at it with the hive. Oh, I'm just kind of haven't done it too much. I kind of forgot what I was going to say, so I won't even spend time thinking about it. Um, oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. One other thing, again, I mentioned how it will, um, you know, will realign your political thinking. But when you I believe when you look at this world as a beehive, a, a machine, and we'll see what Paul Kingsnorth says, is that you see, again, that this this thing that's called left, you know, like the 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 desexing of everybody, uh, postmodernism, this new supposedly uh, progressive jargon about race and identity and so forth. You know, when you actually see what's going on in the world through the lens of this, you see very clearly that postmodernism and woke culture is an inherently conservative phenomenon, right? Because Here's it's the not, the, yes, yeah. it's not faceless, the machine. There's people and they deploy this thing to confuse the language so nothing important really changes and so yeah. that you get plugged into the machine. But again, Jordan Peterson, right on so many things, he's out in left field on this one. You know who was out in left field on this one? The recently deceased Pope Benedict. We had looked at these phenomenon and he reduced it all to cultural relativism. Mm -hmm. And I can alert our readers when looked at the way we're looking at it, 
you see something much more savvy and nuanced going on other than the insight, Pope Benedict's insight, that when you say everything is relative, your statement that everything is relative is also relative. Ergo, you mean nothing. No, 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 Pope Benedict. You are a great Pope. You're a brilliant man. But a much bigger game was and is being played. Yeah, much bigger. Yep. The ideology of tyranny. It's savvy. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's the new Puritanism, right? It is, yep. You know, yep, if yep. they burn here, they burn heretics. <laughs> they really do. I mean, uh -huh. they don't use fire now. They just use canceling or whatever else. But they, <laughs> they certainly burn heretics. <laughs> they do burn heretics. Yeah. Uh, this is great. So I'm looking forward to this. What are you doing this weekend? What am I doing? I'm trying to avoid my wife because every time I get up, walk out of my office, she has a giant project for me to do. Yeah. So, this is so, the first time you've been married so many years. Is this a new well, no, thing? I, that's how it goes. No, we, we actually, uh, whatever. Your honey-do list got big. <clears throat> oh, my son's coming over for his birthday. Well, yep. My, my tw he's now 22. Oh, well, it's big. It's big. We, uh, we're going to um, my... Uh, second youngest, she's engaged, and we're going to see one of those things. I don't think it's a big reception. It'll be on Kennedy Lake, a nice uh, Finger Lake. And uh, it's one of those things where we're going to go, they know where they're having their wedding, but we pay a little money and we go to taste the food they're going to eat that night. It seems super okay. fun. Yep, yep. Like so, fun. yep. So, uh, thank you, one and all, uh, to listening to the Regeneration podcast. I encourage you again before we've never asked you to like study up. You know what I was thinking too, Michael, is we could do some week where we say we're going to be at a certain time. And then people could throw questions in the chat. Wouldn't that be we fun? Can, we can do a live stream, huh? Yeah, we both get a lot of correspondence from listeners. We're glad to hear yeah. it, but that could be fun. Yeah. Um, but we look forward to seeing everybody again next week at the Regeneration Podcast. Take Have care. a good week. Yep. Cool, bro. One second.